and gentlemen, my name is Michael Denelin uh, of Russian and Slavic uh, department here at NYU. I teach Russian language and I do occasional talks and participate in various events having to do with the Russian rock here. I also run my own project, Kvartirnik at NYU, bringing uh, musicians to play mostly from Russia and, well, beyond. Uh, and uh, I'm also a musician, uh, having uh, playing in uh, two of my own bands, Interzona and MD and the Healers. And it is with the great pleasure and honor uh, I'm introducing you today, Vladimir Kozlov, uh, the writer, the filmmaker, and the blogger, uh, who uh, has uh, written several uh, books of fiction and non-fiction, uh, some of which received uh, uh, prestigious academic awards. Uh, his uh, most famous film, well, most well-known film from what I understand, is uh, Traces on the Snow, Slidini Snigu, uh, the documentary on the history of uh, seminal pan Siberian punk rock movement of the 1980s. And Vladimir's most recent project is the video blog uh, that is called Underground is Dead. Possibly, uh, it's a, which name is possibly Rikon Boris Grebenshikov's famous uh, rock and roll is dead, but I'm, uh, I'm not quite yet. Uh, the title of today's lecture, as you can see on the screen, is a Russian cultural underground from late 1980s to now. Uh, in uh, this, Vladimir will explore uh, the intriguing landscape of the late Soviet and post-Soviet uh, underground culture from Siberian punk to the Pussy Riot. Please welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for having me here. So, let's talk about Russian underground. Uh, uh, late 1980s, as, it, as I figured out um, at some point, uh, was probably not exactly correct uh, because uh, uh, the 1980s on the ground actually formed uh, a little bit earlier, probably at the beginning of that decade. Uh, the late 1980s uh, is a significant period because that underground began to basically cease to be underground. Uh, it, uh, it was a period when all formerly underground bands, artists, filmmakers began to actually come to, uh, to uh, mainstream audiences. So we'll start a little bit a little bit earlier. And uh, I titled the first uh, part of this lecture like everything is on the ground. Uh, why so? Because under the Soviet system in the 1980s just uh, about all culture unless it was officially approved and sanctioned uh, was uh, either banned uh, or ignored, so pretty much everything was in, in the underground. Uh, there, uh, by, by the early 1980s, uh, the range of factors had, uh, uh, had been there and, uh, that uh, were basically uh, conducive uh, for the formation of, uh, of a massive underground culture. First, uh, uh, the country was uh, totally isolate, <coughs> isolated from the West. The Iron Curtain, under which, uh, through which uh, some books, records, and films occasionally came, but it was always with great difficulty. Official culture was horrible. It was either propaganda or innocuous fluff that was uh, considered uh, safe enough to be, to be sanctioned. And all of that uh, was uh, totally out of touch with the uh, uh, lives of uh, regular people. It, uh, it was totally different from, from what uh, people uh, actually wanted to listen to, to read, uh, to watch. So there was uh, uh, a lot of room for unofficial underground culture. However, it, uh, it doesn't mean that everything that was underground was necessarily subversive or anti-system. Not at all. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, music uh, and uh, visual arts that were 
underground under the Soviet system uh, were absolutely innocuous. They didn't, uh, uh, those uh, people who created all that didn't try to fight the system. They just uh, did what uh, they wanted to, to do. But uh, communist uh, censors were so rigid that, that they didn't, uh, didn't accept anything that, uh, that was different uh, from this uh, so-called uh, socialist realism, a term uh, that arrived uh, under Stalin and uh, was uh, still used until the end of the, of the communist uh, system. Uh, sometimes uh, the communist uh, regime uh, tried to co-opt and uh, control the underground. Uh, one notable example is the system of uh, rock clubs. Uh, rock clubs arrived uh, in various cities of the former Soviet Union in the early 1980s and uh, most of them, basically all of them, were either directly or indirectly controlled by KGB. But the good thing about that was that uh, Bands uh, that uh, didn't openly oppose uh, the Soviet regime, that didn't openly criticize uh, the communist rule, got an opportunity to legitimately uh, perform. Of course, uh, mostly they weren't allowed to tour, uh, making an official record on the only existing uh, state-run <coughs> record label Melodia was uh, out of the question either, but at least uh, they were able to perform at uh, their respective uh, rock clubs. Uh, and uh, this uh, rock club system uh, turned out to be helpful for a bunch of bands such as uh, Aquarium, um, Kino, uh, Park in Leningrad, uh, and uh, some other bands in uh, other parts of the Soviet system. However, if uh, someone wanted to, to be more subversive, um, to be uh, to go a little bit further, then uh, authorities um, cracked, uh, cracked down, and sometimes uh, they cracked down rather hard. One example is uh, Igor Letov, uh, the leader of the band Gordanska uh, Barona Civil Defense. In late 1985, he was, uh, uh, he was detained by authorities and thrown into a mental institution for making homespun records, uh, some of which uh, were considered uh, subversive. His uh, bandmate, Konstantin Rebinov, was uh, sent to a mandatory military service, even though he wasn't supposed to, uh, to serve at all because of his heart uh, condition. Uh, consequences uh, could have been even more disastrous. Uh, Let have spent uh, eventually he spent uh, several months at that mental institution. But as I as I'm saying, consequences uh, could have been more disastrous. But it was over the 1985, 1986 uh, uh, reforms uh, known as the Perestroika and Glasnost had already begun in the Soviet Union, and probably that had. Uh, an impact uh, on that uh, specific case, and he was released uh, from the mental institution. He was able to continue to make homespun records, but uh, for about a year or so, he was uh, still uh, wary of, uh, of the authorities. Uh, uh, by, by the mid and late 1980s, uh, an entire infrastructure, if you can say so, uh, of uh, underground arts and culture had been created. Uh, for musicians, uh, it was uh, primarily uh, semi-legitimate or totally legitimate shows that uh, uh, were organized at uh, really odd places like uh, secondary schools, uh, sometimes uh, uh, universities. Uh, basically, um, those who organized those shows, those, shows uh, those early promoters, they just uh, tricked um, the management into into doing something like that. So all that was illegal, and uh, when uh, there was a crackdown on those uh, show promoters around 1984, they had to move their operations to 
private departments and uh, uh, did so-called uh, Cartier <coughs> Excuse me. Shows that uh, people's uh, private departments. It was similar for uh, underground filmmakers who screened their films at private departments and uh, for visual artists uh, who um, who exhibited uh, their works also in uh, people's private apartments. So that was uh, kind of an infrastructure. Of course, within the scope of this uh, lecture, it is, uh, it is hardly possible to mention uh, all were the uh, people and uh, uh, movements. Uh, so I decided to focus on uh, a few examples that I consider um, to be most uh, interesting. And uh, the first example is Parallel uh, Kino, or Parallel Cinema in English. Uh, this was an underground uh, group of filmmakers uh, that existed in Leningrad in the um, early, uh, well, it started uh, in the early 1980s and existed throughout the decade. Uh, and uh, as the name suggests, uh, what they did uh, was totally parallel to the official uh, film industry. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, uh, they drew inspiration from many sources, including early Soviet cinema, which uh, was really experimental and innovative back in the 1920s. But uh, by the 1980s, uh, mainstream Soviet cinema was uh, basically uh, horrible and um, controlled, uh, uh, ideologically controlled, uh, which uh, again didn't result in uh, anything good uh, except for a few notable uh, exceptions. Uh, so what they did uh, was uh, really outrageous compared to, to regular Soviet films. Uh, uh, they, of course, they didn't have access to professional equipment. Uh, no one was able to have access to professional equipment at that time. So they uh, they used amateur uh, cameras, uh, and uh, their films were black and white, uh, grainy. They had numerous technical problems, but uh, no one cared about it because uh, the content was uh, more important and the content was really controversial and radical. They uh, filmed, uh, they filmed sex, uh, violence, uh, things like that. The <coughs> uh, among the most uh, well best known uh, participants of that moment uh, were. Uh, Yevgeny Yufit, uh, <coughs> Igor and Glea Balenikov, and uh, Boris Yukhananov. And Yufit, he even uh, invented his own style, which he called necro realism. Uh, he filmed uh, corpses, uh, <coughs> and, uh, uh, in his films, uh, corpses did all kinds of things, including having sex. So that was pretty radical. For, uh, for the Soviet cinema of that uh, period, of course. Uh, <coughs> members of that, um, of that uh, group got access to the official film industry in the late 1980s. There was even an attempt uh, for them to work with the director Alexander Sakurov on one of his um, projects, but it eventually, eventually went nowhere. And uh, uh, parallel cinema remained a kind of a marginal phenomenon. Uh, they didn't, uh, they made some feature length films within the industry, but none of them uh, was really successful. Uh, at uh, the festival circuit uh, uh, internationally or within Russia. Um, probably it was uh, because uh, of their films were, on the one hand, the two radical uh, and subversive for mainstream audiences, but on the other hand, uh, they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't uh, fall in with the uh, paradigm of uh, alter cinema, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, what uh, was uh, uh, interesting for film festivals. So uh, by now I think um, some of those people are dead and those, uh, those who are still alive, uh, they don't, uh, don't do much in, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of cinema. 
Another uh, very interesting cultural phenomenon of the period is uh, Siberian uh, punk rock. I already mentioned Yegor Letov as uh, one of the um, best known and uh, most uh, seminal uh, people in that, uh, in that movement. Actually, uh, punk rock in the Soviet Union uh, um, uh, was, uh, to, to some extent, uh, pretty much all the punk bands rebelled against the Soviet system. Some of them did it more directly, some of them did it uh, in a less direct way, but uh, Siberian punk rockers went uh, a little bit further in being outspoken about the communist system. Rudanska Barona's uh, song Vsyoyder Paklano is uh, probably some kind of uh, an official anthem of rebellion against the the Soviet system, and uh, it is uh, still remembered uh, to, uh, to these days, and uh, probably even even perceived by some people as being something more than just a song about the communist system, but uh, uh, a song about rebellion against uh, against any system. Uh, why Siberia? Uh, this is also. An interesting question. I actually made, uh, as, uh, as uh, Mikhail mentioned, a documentary focused on that uh, scene, Traces in the Snow. And uh, in that film, uh, people I spoke with tried to answer this question, but actually, frankly, their answers didn't uh, satisfy me. And I don't think there is an answer why specifically uh, that uh, punk rock movement uh, originated in Siberia. My own reply is that. Uh, uh, those key people for that movement, such as Letov or Roman Nilmoyev or Yana Dagilev, just happened to live in Siberia. They happened to meet each other. They happened to feed uh, of each other ideas and help each other with uh, reporting their materials. That's uh, why Siberia. Probably they could uh, could have lived in some in some other place. Maybe it it would have been different music. Maybe it would have been uh, similar. Um, later in the decade, uh, uh, punk rock uh, bands from Siberia uh, got an opportunity to tour, to play legitimate shows, and uh, again uh, they wanted to, to, they didn't uh, want to be part of that official system, and uh, they were rebellious enough for that. In, 19, in 1990, a lot of uh, Dismissed Rudanska Barona, saying he didn't want uh, to be part of that uh, of that system. Uh, the band reformed in uh, three years, uh, and I uh, was uh, active until Leto's death in 2008. Uh, but it was already a different uh, different story. Um, by the end of uh, the 1980s. Ideologic, ideological censorship uh, basically no longer existed. Uh, it was uh, changing very radically. As I said, uh, uh, formerly underground bands uh, were getting an opportunity to play legitimate shows. Artists were able to legitimately exhibit their works and uh, uh, sell them, even filmmakers as uh, uh, members of the Berlin Cinema Movement were able to uh, to work in the industry. So by the uh, by the early 1990s, uh, the situation uh, changed uh, uh, quite uh, quite drastically. And uh, when we uh, when we talk about uh, the um, the Russian underground of the 1990s, uh, we have to uh, to look not at ideology as it was in the case in the 1980s, but at uh, relations between underground culture and, uh, and the capitalist uh, system. Uh, Sergey Guryev, a prominent uh, cultural critic and uh, editor of the magazine Contra Cultura, uh, once uh, described uh, underground in general as uh, uh, creative endeavors of people who have actually no desire to be part of the official system, who don't want to be 
uh, don't, don't want to be paid for what they're doing and are focused uh, specifically on their creative work. He also said that uh, if the 1980s uh, underground was mainly ideological, the 1990s uh, underground was uh, to a large extent uh, anti-capitalist. Which uh, the, uh, this idea might be debatable to some some people, but I basically share it, and I also think that uh, uh, the 1990s were a period of uh, sort of an anti-capitalist uh, underground. Uh, of course, there were people who uh, who were eager to to be part of. Uh, of the mainstream uh, to be part of the capitalist system uh, to, uh, to get paid for what they were doing but uh, uh, there were also um, people who deliberately didn't didn't want to do that who were deliberately anti um, anti capitalist uh, um, who didn't uh, didn't get involved with all those uh, commercial uh, the relations uh, didn't think about monetizing their, uh, their creative works. And uh, um, again, a few um, examples of uh, uh, phenomena from, the, uh, from, that, from that period. Uh, first, uh, uh, first one is uh, Tam Tam Club, which existed in uh, St. Petersburg uh, in the uh, early 1990s. It was actually one of Russia's uh, first uh, music clubs in the uh, Western, in the Western format. Before that we didn't have anything like that. But this is why uh, even punk bands had to, to play sitting venues in which uh, we didn't often uh, work too well because, uh, um, because people just uh, destroyed all those seats. <laughs> so, uh, one of the first uh, clubs. Uh, it was uh, founded by Vsevolod um, Gakel, former uh, violinist uh, in the rock band uh, Aquarium. Um, he toured um, with the Aquarium a little bit. He had been to um, Western countries and he saw this format of a club and he wanted to, uh, to uh, try to create something similar up at home. So, Tam Tam. Uh, he also was kind of uh, fed up with uh, traditional Russian rock. By the early 1990s uh, there had been already a traditional Russian rock. Uh, <laughs> Which, uh, which wasn't always uh, uh, good and interesting. And so he wanted uh, more experimental stuff. Uh, punk uh, was okay. Uh, some other experimental bands uh, were okay. Uh, the club uh, uh, made a point of uh, not uh, paying artists uh, for their shows in any money. Uh, artists, bands were paid in year if uh, if uh, a performance was considered good the band would um, you know, would collect two cases of beer and that, uh, if it uh, was not so good it was just one, uh, one <laughs> case of beer. Uh, this uh, this club uh, for uh, for probably a couple of years or so it was nearly the only place in St. Petersburg where uh, where bands uh, could play whose music didn't fit any any formats, any any style, any stylistic boundaries, and uh, eventually a few a few bands that uh, played there uh, became uh, uh, local uh, local stars. Like for instance, a band, a band called Himera. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, didn't go far because. Um, because its um, frontman Edward uh, Starkov uh, committed suicide in 1998. However, it was uh, uh, it had the uh, potential to become probably one of the most prominent uh, Russian bands of the era. Uh, another band uh, that um, uh, uh, started its career at Tom Tom and uh, really went far. 
is uh, Corolla and Ishut. Uh, uh, they went on to become really uh, punk stars uh, in the early 2000s, although I, I never liked that uh, band and uh, considered them uh, kind of uh, sellouts, but uh, still, that's uh, uh, their career, basically, uh, Tom Tom kick started their career. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the club uh, wasn't able to exist uh, as some kind of an isolated place, isolated from what was happening in St. Petersburg of the 1990s. And uh, it soon became a place where drug dealers pushed their drugs. And uh, yeah, so it resulted in, in uh, police uh, showing up and uh, threatening to shut down the club. Also, uh, there were some uh, property disputes uh, which eventually uh, led to the, uh, to the closure of the Tam Tam in uh, 1996. Uh, another uh, phenomenon of the 1990s is uh, an art movement uh, uh, named the uh, <coughs> Anonymne i bez, uh, i bezplatne iskustva for anonymous and free art, uh, known by its uh, Russian abbreviation ZB, which uh, sounds quite <laughs> quite profane. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm sure it was uh, it was done deliberately, and uh, the the movement uh, wanted to, um, to provoke. It wanted to be to be radical. It uh, uh, drew an inspiration from a number of sources, including the situa Situationist International Movement, uh, political and art movement, uh, which, was, um, origin which originated in France in the 1950s. And also another source of their inspiration was uh, of the Moscow Conceptualist um, Art Movement that uh, existed uh, from the 1970s. Uh, uh, members of uh, ZAB worked in uh, several areas. Uh, they made videos, uh, they, they did performance art, they published uh, some of that uh, zines. Uh, the <coughs> uh, their ideology um, was uh, kind of bizarre because uh, it included some uh, uh, nearly Marxist ideas. Uh, they were hardcore anti-capitalist, uh, uh, but uh, even, uh, even disagreeing with uh, their political agenda, uh, I have to admit uh, that uh, their ideas uh, that um, concerned arts uh, were at least interesting. Uh, they believed uh, that um, you didn't uh, have um, to, uh, to be trained to be an artist. Basically, everyone could be an artist. You don't have to come from a privileged background, you don't have to, uh, to spend years uh, uh, training, you don't have to uh, to find a huge funding for your projects uh, to be able to, to be an artist. This, uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, was uh, very similar to, for instance, uh, the DIY punk ideology of the 1970s. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, was uh, uh, that uh, made this movement uh, stand out among some other uh, art movements of the of the period, although of course uh, they remained a very marginal uh, phenomenon. Uh, for uh, the official culture, never never really noticed it. Uh, although later, if uh, we look at, uh, at later art movements. 
um, for instance, uh, Vojna, a well-known art movement of the 2000s, uh, what they did uh, to, some, to some extent is quite, um, quite similar uh, to, to what, uh, uh, what ZAB did uh, back in the, in the 1990s. Uh, uh, as I said, it was often performance art, which, uh, uh, which wasn't even uh, properly uh, recorded, like uh, one of their well-known uh, performance was uh, just uh, uh, a travel from uh, Moscow to St. Petersburg, and just uh, not, uh, not inside uh, train cars, but outside uh, train cars. Just which was uh, dangerous uh, enough, uh, but uh, uh, totally in line with uh, their overall ideology. Moving to uh, the uh, present, uh, moving to present day. Uh, uh, I had to ask uh, this uh, question, what is underground? I mean, what is underground in uh, contemporary Russia? Although probably this, this question could, uh, could be asked uh, uh, more generally, not, uh, uh, not <coughs> in relation specifically to Russia, because uh, uh, a lot uh, has uh, changed in the, in the field of arts and culture. A lot uh, has been going on, and uh, all those developments, uh, artistic, uh, technological, social developments, they uh, they have had a huge impact and uh, uh, boundaries are blurred and uh, it, is, uh, it is harder to say uh, this is on the ground and this is not. Uh, in the 1980s uh, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, when we speak about the Soviet Union, there was uh, official culture and there was everything else which was basically underground. <clears throat> in the 1990s, uh, there was again uh, official arts and culture, often, often commercialized, and there was, uh, uh, there was everything else which was pretty much uh, those who didn't want to be part of that commercial uh, commercial scene, commercial industries. Now, it is a little bit more more complicated. For, uh, there is uh, uh, a substantial array of uh, unofficial arts and culture in Russia. Artists uh, who have nothing to do with the, with the official system who receive no funding from the government, who exist independently, but uh, they are not on the ground. They, uh, they perform for huge audiences. Uh, they, uh, uh, they promote themselves uh, using the social media or YouTube. So I wouldn't call them on the ground. Like, for instance, uh, there is uh, a rap scene which has been uh, uh, which has been booming of the last uh, few years with uh, uh, lots of uh, people, especially young people, attracted to that scene. Um, but uh, calling them underground uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be correct. Although there was an interesting situation late last year when uh, local authorities in a few Russian cities tried to cra <coughs> crack down on some uh, rap artists such as Husky and uh, cancelled uh, some of his shows 
under ridiculous uh, pretexts. Interestingly, uh, the federal authorities uh, didn't uh, didn't uh, want to go the same uh, the same way. They condemned uh, condemned the local authorities. Said what they did was actually stupid. And again, this is an interesting example and comparison uh, with what was done back in the 1980s. Um, back in the 1980s, um, communist authorities were totally rigid. They just uh, uh, condemned and banned everything. Uh, authorities in contemporary Russia understand that uh, uh, they probably shouldn't antagonize uh, young people because of artists who are totally non-political, who are not a threat to the system, and even though they uh, they promote uh, the wrong values, that was uh, the main problem uh, local authorities had with them, that uh, those rappers uh, promote uh, sexual promiscuity, they promote uh, drug and alcohol abuse, which I think rappers all around the world uh, do. So, um, <laughs> but uh, eventually, I think they are off the hook, and um, it's not. They're not uh, going to uh, to have a lot of um, a lot of um, you know, problems. Uh, one of the most, uh, if if we try to single out uh, some kind of underground. Uh, phenomenon in contemporary in contemporary Russia, probably it could be it could be Pussy Riot, because of course we could uh, uh, we could see some similarities between what they did. I mean, what they did originally before they were sentenced to prison terms. Uh, actually, uh, there is uh, this uh, kind of uh, kind of inheritance between uh, as a B because they were also anonymous uh, originally Pussy Riot were anonymous no one actually knew who was in that band and uh, they didn't have a constant lineup although it it was still uh, it wasn't exactly punk rock I discussed this with uh, some people the other day and uh, that was an interesting idea. No one knows a single Pussy Riot song. Yeah. They didn't. Uh, they didn't focus on songs. It was just a part of their performance. It was part of uh, uh, their image, like uh, uh, young women uh, wearing those uh, balaclavas and uh, wearing guitars and playing something. But uh, songs in themselves uh, were of little importance. Is it was much more important to, um, to do those impromptu uh, performances uh, in various uh, places, like uh, I remember at some jewelry store, um, uh, somewhere else. Uh, before that, uh, uh, that best known uh, punk prayer performance at the <coughs> uh, at the. Uh, Christ and the Savior Cathedral in Moscow, which resulted in uh, in sentencing three of those uh, uh, of the members of Pussy Riot and uh, prison prison terms. Uh, everything that's happened uh, uh, since then, everything that's been done under the uh, Pussy Riot name since then is. Uh, is already a different a different story, but uh, before that, uh, uh, before the Palm Prayer, what they did uh, was uh, totally totally in line with uh, with the underground principles uh, as I understand them. But again, it was uh, uh, a single a single phenomenon uh, that. Um, was uh, quite isolated, and uh, uh, had uh, they not uh, been sentenced to prison terms, uh, uh, they wouldn't have been known uh, that 
uh, as much uh, as uh, they are today, they would have stayed uh, just a very marginal phenomenon, just like uh, they be back in the, in the 1990s or the Vaina group, uh, of which actually some Pusarai uh, were members uh, in the 2000s. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, this is rather an exception. Often there are yeah, comparisons between uh, 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 between the 1980s and uh, contemporary Russia, uh, because uh, back in the 1980s. We had an, authorita an excuse me, authoritarian regime, and now we have an authoritarian regime. And uh, uh, there is an idea that uh, authoritarianism uh, can foster a rebellion and uh, can uh, be sort of a catalyst uh, for an official underground arts and culture. And uh, I remember hearing predictions like a few years ago that uh, uh, there would be something like a creative explosion, uh, an underground creative explosion in Russia. So far, it hasn't happened. <laughs> so uh, probably uh, I've been thinking about it. I've been trying to uh, to. <coughs> to figure out why it is so, why there were like uh, hundreds or probably thousands of underground bands uh, in the Soviet Union, some of which uh, were really subversive and, uh, and um, political, and why this is not uh, happening in contemporary Russia, or even if it is happening, it is happening um, at uh, it's a very, very small scale, just being very marginal. I think it's um, the main reason is that um, the present, uh, uh, well, contemporary Russia is still very different uh, from the uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, despite the authoritarian regime. It uh, still leaves a lot of room for creative expression as long as you don't come in direct uh, conflict with the government, as long as you don't uh, criticize, for instance, Putin directly and uh, openly and have a huge audience, because you can criticize him if you have an audience of 100 people. Nobody cares. Authorities. Uh, in contemporary Russia are not that stupid as uh, communist, communist authorities were. Uh, and a lot of people just uh, have their niches in this, uh, in, uh, uh, this uh, environment, and they don't have to, to go rebellious, they don't have to rebel, they could just focus on their, on their creative art, the creative uh, endeavors on their art, and do what they want. Uh, no one would uh, tell them what to do. No one would uh, would try to uh, censor them, censor them, um, and of course uh, there are also enough people who are just conformist, who prefer to to do what uh, uh, what uh, the government expect them to do, to uh, to take advantage of that, uh, to collect uh, government uh, money, uh, government funding, to uh, to do what. Uh, 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 what they they are doing, of course, uh, it comes uh, it comes with a price tag. Uh, they have to to do things that are ideologically safe, or uh, if not uh, if not uh, direct uh, propaganda, but it's uh, it's the choice people make, as uh, there is always a choice to make. I think that's uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to to, uh, to say. But if, uh, um, there are questions, of course, I'd be happy to have some kind of, uh, some kind of discussion.
You mentioned that there was a difference um, in Pussy Riot before and after the performance in the cathedral. Mm -hmm. What was the, the difference before and after? Well, basically, they were an under, an anonymous yeah. underground. At a world stage. And a collective. Yeah. And uh, now they are some kind of uh, international celebrities uh, uh, who are basically cashing in on, uh, mm -hmm. on their celebrity status. Of course, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, they they paid uh, they paid a serious price. Uh, they spent nearly two years in prison, which is really really huge price. Uh, so uh, I, <coughs> in no way, am I blaming them or accusing them of uh, selling out or something. It's just that they are doing something different. That's uh, that's all. Um, you said that uh, nowadays such phenomenon as underground doesn't really exist in Russia. I will ask the question, what about all those numerous uh, bands and artists uh, residing in pretty much every single uh, Russian city uh, that have uh, absolutely no means of being heard on any sort of uh, well, uh, mass uh, scale? Uh, that have no means to uh, break out, basically. And uh, many of those bands are uh, very interesting and talented. Uh, how do you... Uh, uh, I just, uh, I understand, of course, what you're saying. I just wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, refer to them as underground. They are just, uh, uh, they are just bands that are unable to, to get exposure in the in the existing system, but I think it's uh, it's in the same uh, it's in the, uh, the same situation for every country. Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, uh, I mean, uh, I would uh, I uh, it's uh, it's the way I see things. But to me, to be at the ground, you have to do something subversive, something uh, uh, something that really uh, makes uh, uh, makes you stay on the ground. Uh, it's really hard to say who is talented and who isn't. It's very subjective. Like a band, uh, one band uh, uh, breaks into the mainstream, another band doesn't. And uh, there are a lot of people who would say uh, that the band who has uh, broken into the mainstream uh, was, uh, is much less uh, talented than the other one. It's just, uh, I mean, uh, it's very, very, very subjective. Uh, but, uh, it's not uh, that uh, they are unable to get exposure because they are doing some uh, something radical or subversive. It's just uh, uh, the way the industry works, which is, I think, uh, a slightly different issue. Of course, I am absolutely unhappy with how the how the music industry, how the book publishing industry, how the film industry work in the, in Russia. But it's uh, it's a little bit uh, a different. It's a uh, uh, it's uh, it's not exactly about underground. It's about something else, as far as I see. If you, you're speaking of pussy right, it made me think of one thing. Um, in this age of social media and like exposure that you cannot avoid, even if you have a concert for ten people, somehow it will get out into the world. Do you have to be anonymous to be underground? To say underground? Uh, probably you don't have to, but uh, to me it was a very uh, radical gesture because everyone wants exposure. Everyone's, uh, everyone wants to somehow capitalize on their personal project, on uh, to make uh, uh, to make a brand name out of uh, uh, out of their own name. And here, here is uh, a movement, a band people who don't want that. So, uh, I mean, it was, uh, I liked it as a, as a concept, but, uh, uh, but again, it's something that works just once. They, they were, in that specific period, in that specific era, uh, they were the first. Uh, if, if now, for instance, we had a bunch of bands who, who claimed that to be anonymous and, and uh, uh, tried to say, well, we are cool, we are better because we are anonymous, I don't think it would work. Um, how do you, what do you do in terms of research to find out whether there is an underground in, uh, in Russia today? Because by your own definition, these people will not be 
easily found. And also you and all of us are now much older, like when you're 15 or 17, it's easy to kind of find your way into underground. But when you are older, like we're, we're a different generation, it's not going to easily find us. How do you know that there isn't an underground in Nova Sibirik someplace uh, that you're just not aware of? Uh, of course, uh, there might be something. It's uh, again, it's uh, you made a very interesting point because uh, if if we try to to be really radical, if we if we try to find the most radical definitions, then uh, we can come to a conclusion that if someone is really underground, we no wouldn't fun. we wouldn't know about them. So uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go that way. I just uh, I try to uh, to follow what's going on in uh, in music and film and literature, and of course, uh, to, uh, I I couldn't I couldn't possibly say that. Well, I know uh, there is no underground. No, I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, that it's difficult uh, to uh, to figure out what is underground in contemporary Russian culture. If, uh, if there, uh, there are some uh, phenomena similar to, to those I mentioned from the 1980s and uh, the 1990s, at least, I don't know, uh, phenomena similar in scale. So individual artists, of course, uh, they could be, they could exist, but again, at least at some underground level they should uh, they should have exposure if someone doesn't uh, deliberately doesn't have to to have exposure that's probably too underground but that's <laughs> that's not what uh, what we are talking about um, ignoring whether or not they're underground or not are there contemporary examples of bands that are subversive and get enough of a following that they're, sh they're shut down or they're um, suppressed in some way by, by the government? Is, are there any examples of that in, in contemporary uh, uh, recency? Uh, there are uh, bands that I consider to be probably slightly subversive, but uh, uh, they uh, uh, they are not harassed uh, by authorities because, as I as I already said, in contemporary Russia, authorities are not that stupid to to spend their energy. Well, sometimes they are stupid, but uh, in this specific in this specific area, they uh, they don't spend their energy and resources on fighting, say, a band. Uh, uh, with uh, maybe a following of uh, several several thousand people uh, nationwide, why why do that? Mm -hmm. Although uh, uh, again, it's uh, uh, one example that uh, comes to uh, to my mind uh, is a band uh, called uh, Последние Танки в Париже, which has some quite uh, uh, subversive lyrics. At least it had. Uh, some of those of those songs with a sort of subversive lyrics. Uh, they haven't had problems lately, but at some point in the early 2000s, when uh, when members of that band just uh, uh, said something against local authorities, it wasn't even parts of a of a song. They just uh, came in uh, in some kind of conflict. Uh, they were just beaten up, yeah. and they were threatened with much uh, uh, much worse consequences. Yeah. Uh, what about the situation with the band or hugely famous band Machina Vremi? Uh, when Makarevich uh, made uh, his position clear on the position on Ukraine, uh, Machina Vremi, to the best of my knowledge, is effectively banned from any kind of larger scale shows. <laughs> now they're uh, forced to perform on like smaller venues. And also, what about a televisor? Uh, I heard uh, from uh, Mikhail Barzikin that it's very difficult for them to find a venue to perform, given his uh, 
I wouldn't call them subversive, really direct anti-Putin uh, stance. Uh, thanks for mentioning Televisa specifically. I respect uh, Bozikin and uh, I respect his uh, stands, stance on uh, many, many things. Frankly, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, sure about, about uh, uh, bans on uh, performances. I think what you're referring to is more like self-censorship. It's like venues <coughs> don't want to, uh, to host shows by artists whom they consider to be subversive or not safe enough because they are afraid that uh, the artist uh, would, uh, would get off easily, but that they would have problems. As when it comes to Makarevich, you know, the situation is, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, different. I don't like people who change their, their opinions uh, because, of, uh, uh, because of what happens. I think uh, uh, Makarevich uh, said totally different things in the 2000s. He, uh, uh, I don't remember if he openly pra praised Putin. But at least he he was he wasn't uh, um, he wasn't against him. Okay, I think I, rem I remember uh, when, when I'm trying to remember uh, there was an interview in the Russian edition of the of the Rolling Stone magazine <coughs> in the mid 2000s, in which I might be I, I might be mistaken. So so I just uh, I'm making this kind of disclaimer. But I think he said something that he's happy with the regime, with Putin's regime, because that regime allows him to do what he, uh, what he, uh, uh, what he wanted to do. And then it uh, kind of, uh, he, was, uh, he was part of the system. He was absolutely part of the system. He was an absolute conformist in the 2000s. Then suddenly something happens, he changes his mind. Uh, well, of course, he, uh, I, I remember I heard of those uh, cancellations of his shows, but I cannot sympathize with him. I cannot, uh, I cannot relate to that because, uh, uh, because originally he was uh, he was part of the system. He was uh, he he contributed to uh, to the creation of that system. I don't remember if he was if he took part in that uh, meeting uh, in the Kremlin in which uh, rock musicians. Uh, Took uh, took part and they were invited. Actually, that's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I just uh, uh, I remember uh, a few, maybe even ten years ago, I I was commissioned to uh, to write a story on what happened with those rock heroes of the of the 1980s who were so anti-communist and anti-system at the, that time. And by the mid uh, by the mid 2000. Uh, 2000s, uh, they were totally conformist, and they were uh, supporting uh, Putin's regime. So that's uh, that's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Actually, it doesn't have anything to do. Doesn't have much to do with the underground, but how people changed, how they uh, how they w uh, went uh, from being anti-system and rebellious to basically uh, being a part of the system. That's uh, that's interesting. I think. Uh, someone should uh, uh, should do research on that, maybe even write a book. I, th I want to make a comment, but it's not a question. I just um, was talking to a young writer who writes for theater, and he um, was he's he's not underground, but politically he's anti anti system. But he was open to taking government grants because he feels. Well, it's taxpayers' money. I am part of this nation. Why should why should not I participate in the, you know, grants that are funded by tax, my my compatriots? So he didn't see it as a playing the game. He felt like he's a citizen of this country. So hmm. yeah, but yeah. it's uh, as long as uh, that person didn't have. Uh, 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 as long as that person had some creative control, that's okay. But uh, mostly, uh, as far as I know, at least in the film industry, uh, ten years ago, 
it was uh, it was still possible to uh, to get uh, government funding for a film that would be critical of not of uh, the government of course but uh, critical uh, critical of the of uh, the reality reality uh, of life in Russia but these days it's no longer possible the culture ministry wouldn't wouldn't allow that anymore I think Leviathan by Andreas Vagans mm -hmm. was uh, some kind of uh, yeah. uh, um, some kind of a landmark in that after that they decided no 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 mm -hmm. Any, um, in the 70s, when the real underground was, had uh, you know, aesthetic differences with the government, they did not want to participate in Soviet life, but for aesthetic reasons. And there was a lot of really important literature was published with, with great that anything is happening in the literary world, or is it just way too easy to publish and it's a self-publish and there's this uh, not it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting question because I think uh, the role of literature has, uh, has declined uh, a lot and uh, uh, the, I think the level of censorship in literature is much lower than in the film and mm -hmm. probably music. For instance, this ridiculous law that uh, uh, that prohibits uh, uh, profanity, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, uh, adopted, I think, five years ago. It doesn't apply to literature. It applies to film, it applies to theater, it applies to music performances, but it doesn't, it doesn't apply to literature. So in literature you could, uh, you could use swear words in print, you don't have to, uh, to use asterisks, it's just uh, some publishers, uh, they just, uh, uh, they prefer this uh, self-censorship uh, thing. That's why they, uh, they do it. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not illegal, it's not prohibited. You just have to put 18 plus on the cover of a book and you're safe. So it's uh, probably this, uh, this is a sign that uh, our authorities don't really care about what's, uh, what's happening in literature because it's, uh, it doesn't have that much of an impact, it's so uh, uh, a small scale. So, uh, yeah, but uh, coming back to your question, it's, uh, you don't have to be underground these days. There is no distinctions, uh, no distinction uh, between underground and uh, some and the mainstream. Uh, for instance, a book that uh, uh, that has been shortlisted for one of the uh, uh, main prizes, national bestseller. I haven't read it, but yet. Uh, but what I've heard, it's uh, it's uh, really, uh, really uh, not not probably radical. But it contains a lot of, a lot of uh, sex, uh, violence, and uh, other stuff that's not that's not really tolerated by, uh, by a traditional, uh, uh, traditional establishment. So but it's it's there. So that's an example of uh, saying that there is uh, no really distinction between underground and, and mainstream literature. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, I was thinking in Russian. Um, but uh, have you seen the film somewhere and what do you think about it? Oh, well, yes, I, of course I've seen it. Uh, and uh, uh, frankly, I hoped uh, that I would like it, but I hated it. <laughs> Uh, and again, I was uh, I know I noticed on um, the social media that uh, people are basically divided on that film. That uh, some people uh, really really liked it, and uh, some other people really really hated it. And when I tried to kind of um, to uh, analyze, to in uh, to intellectualize my feeling, my emotions uh, from that film. It was just uh, it was just difficult. I maybe because uh, before listening to more underground bands, I listened to 
to those uh, Leningrad Rock Club bands uh, for several years when I was, uh, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years old. And I have my own understanding of uh, that, uh, uh, how it, uh, of, uh, how it worked, how it was. But uh, I, I think uh, making a biopic is very hard. It's probably one of the hardest uh, genres in the film. I can think of only one uh, uh, biopic re re related to music which I liked and which uh, I think uh, was able to say something about the character. Uh, that was uh, Last Days by Gus Van Sant, uh, which uh, again uh, was uh, centered on an unnamed uh, musician, but of course uh, it was about Kurt Cobain of Nirvana. Uh, mm, so it's really hard, and uh, I have some uh, issues with the letter in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of purely uh, filmmaking techniques. Uh, because even uh, at, uh, at the level of a screenplay, I have some, uh, some issues with it. But that's always not important, so that's all like into intellectualizing, analyzing. It's I just, uh, my gut feeling was against it. I just, uh, uh, at an emotional level, I just uh, didn't, didn't accept it. More questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, before you uh, leave, let me uh, take this opportunity to, uh, first of all, thank Vladimir Kozlov for his excellent lecture. Very interesting. Uh, and second, for some shameless, shameless self-promotion. But I think what, what, what uh, I'm about to say is very much related to uh, Vladimir's lecture. If you guys are interested at all uh, in uh, the part of post-Soviet uh, cultural underground that resides here in New York, uh, you might be interested in uh, coming to a show that we're uh, having on April 13th, this Saturday, that is titled Space Rock Concerts, Space Rocks Concerts, that uh, features many of the, well, uh, more or less prominent uh, figures in, uh, today, uh, in today's uh, post-Soviet, post-Russian, I don't even know how to label it properly, uh, musicians and uh, bands residing here in New York, such as uh, Father of Sam, uh, Never Heaven, uh, Starkov, uh, and uh, Atrizalov Orchestra, and my own band in Trizona, uh, celebrating uh, the first man in space, uh, as you know, April 12th, uh, the Cosmonauts Day. Once again, thank you very much for having